Before I introduce myself, I'd like to introduce Jeremiah Theronka, who is an award-winning inventor um, and is the founder of Optum Energy just at the age of 17. Jeremiah is 24 now, so he has a great track record of uh, contributing to a brighter tomorrow. By way of introduction, I am Mohamed Luqman. I am the chairman of the Mubadala Youth Council, and I am part of the integrated and marketing, integrated marketing and partnerships team at Mubadala Investment Company. At Mubadala, our mandate is to generate sustainable financial returns and to create a more promising future for future generations. Before we start, Jeremiah, I'd like to um, I'd like to touch on a personal story. My story with the uh, energy transition or the energy field started before I was born, actually. You see, my father is a chemical engineer, and he's sitting here in the audience today. And his story of how he went to the United States to study and come back to the UAE is a journey of resilience and, you know, especially when you uh, leave your home country to uh, learn and to explore, you, uh, that's a challenge in itself. And I think uh, within that journey, I learned that every era has a story when it comes to the energy transition. So, as many of you have seen, when you landed in Dubai, the beautiful streets and roads and the lights, the tall buildings, that wasn't a reality 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago. It was a continuous process towards innovation and growth. So when my father used to travel from Abu Dhabi to Hebshan, where the oil fields were, as an engineer, the streets were dangerous. People often uh, drove on roads where the infrastructure was still being built. The lighting wasn't there. Some even lost their lives when camels would randomly run across the roads. So that is a story that I carry with me. And before we start with your story, Jeremiah, I remember we were once on the way to school. I was about nine years old. And I think I asked my father the most difficult question in the world because the, the question was very simple. And I asked, why is not everything green? And I meant literally, little did I know that in today's world, the context would be different as the word green now is used in a multitude of ways. And his response to me was that if everything was green, then we wouldn't be able to see the different things. And for me, there are different green things in our world today that we can look forward and towards. My father was cent the central s pillar to my father's journey and, and his career from the energy sector to the human capital sector to the in uh, healthcare industry was the human element. That was the most important aspect that we are here talking today because our ideas, as Jeremiah and I were catching up earlier today, our ideas are really truly defined by the people we touch. And so, Jeremiah, I, uh, I'm very happy that you're here with us today. We're here to convene the youth community. Tell me your story. How did Optum Energy start? Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Optum Energy basically has been um, a very um, long journey, you know, from its conception. Actually, it started during my time in high school. So what happened was, I was born during the, Sierra Leone, um, the 11 years period of Sierra Leone Civil War. And one thing that was very prominent was the fact that 
access to energy was never in the conversation in the first place because the, the efforts was towards ending the civil war. But then within that same period, we also started experiencing the impact of climate change. So when you go to local communities, you will experience things like flooding happening, people were cutting down as much forest as they want because they need to light up their homes at night, etc. And then when I finished um, primary school, I was fortunate to go into St. Edwards, depending on who you ask. I will say it's the best school, but then people may disagree. Um, so every single day I was moving from like this particular community in the dead east of Freetown to St. Edwards that is in the dead west. Of course, the whole country was in civil war, but then, you know, people in the dead west had some level of security and some power. So whenever I go to this community, kind of, you know, you see kids very much happy. There was electricity everywhere. And then I have to move every evening back to my own home. So I felt it was not correct. It was not right. One thing was very prominent during that same period was people were waiting for others to come and solve it. Right? People, you hear conversations like, oh, government, NGOs, and stuff like that. So as a young kid, I started thinking on how the little skills that I have and the opportunities that I have to go to that school, I can actually utilize it to see how I can start wherever I can. So the first um, thing that I developed was what was called um, the, um, so the whole idea was fusing um, hydro technology and wind technology. And um, we call it the, the, um, hydro, um, the mini hydro dam. And we implemented it in the community. And um, we were working basically with about 50 young people who come to that, that particular center to just have lightning to study. But then due to the different weather conditions that Sierra Leone has, when we started moving from the raining season to the dry season, the water level went down. And uh, the power that we were able to produce from that particular system was going down. And as a kid at that time, I was like, we, we can't rely on this because, you know, we don't have control over the weather patterns. So I shifted to what we call... Um, um, the free energy generator. So the whole concept was we took a traditional generator and just removed all the polluting parts. And then um, there was a new system in. All one has to do is to rewind the system for six to 10 seconds and you have power for up to 24 hours. A big challenge came in. People don't want to do routine. They want the system to function on its own. So um, while, we were doing, while I was doing the prototyping, I realized that um, the first time people are excited to rewind it for that six to 10 seconds. But then after the 24 hours, they were like, ah, I don't want to do this anymore and stuff like that. And then when I went to uni, I was exposed to a course called urbanization. And we were exploring all these different urban trends and how people are coming to the city, how energy demand is going up. Of course, I don't have the solution to solve all my urban issues. I am not, I, that is not my field. But then I looked at it from the perspective of saying, these people are moving. Our urban centers are exploding with population, which means there is billions of tons of energy that goes untapped. So I started thinking of how I can have something that will absorb these billions of tons that people, you know, in motion, animals, vehicles, whatever. Our cities are always moving. So absorbing that energy and see how I can solve the energy challenge from where I'm coming from. So that is kind of just an overview of the journey of how Optim Energy have been evolving over time and what gave back to Optim Energy. I'm interested to, I'm interested to really find out the thought process, you know, the designing aspect of that. Because when you think about deep solutions like that, there's a lot of work in the background that not a lot of people see. How did that start? So, you know, be it the, towards the end of the Civil War or after the Civil War period, I've, I, I saw a lot, a lot of energy projects and most of them fail most of the time. Not because the technology is not amazing or the technology is not great, but just because that as a developer, they don't factor in a lot of other things. Of course, visibility studies can only take you far but then they don't cater for a lot of the different contextual issues at play. So while I started developing Optim Energy, or when I had the idea, I basically used the social approach to develop the solution. So instead of, as you know, the, the lead person within the whole project, I kind of flipped it around and made the community the center. And then when the community becomes center, they were kind of deriving the whole thought process. 
what goes into the technology? What should we take out due to the different social cultural things that they have at play? And then when all these different design, design thinking processes came into the solution, now they had like full ownership. The solution became a representation or a reflection of the community I was working with at, the same, at, a, at that particular point in time. So that is why when I started doing the piloting, a lot of challenges that conventional startup face, I never faced that because I didn't have to be there. Right? I don't have to chase people for the solution to, to function. We co-created it and it became a reflection of the aspiration and that is what made us have what we have. You know, they often say miracles take human ingenuity. Um, you know, when, when in your design process or thought process, what were the challenges that you overcame ultimately? What are the things that you felt were difficult? I know now that you said, you know, you had to work and integrate the community, but what, what were the things where you said, okay, this is a challenge, how am I going to overcome it? Of course, almost all entrepreneurs or young innovators will tell you funds are a big challenge, resources are a big challenge, of course the skills too because you may have the idea, you may have the, the solution in your heart but then bringing it to life requires a lot and a lot of resources. But then, of course, those ones have already been spoken about all the time or people always speak about those particular challenges but for me, a major challenge is the sociocultural part of developing solutions. Um, I, I, I was from a community that was just coming from civil war. We have different sorts of um, social and cultural issues at play. So while I started doing um, the design process, I liked doing a lot of observation. And from past experiences in other, other energy projects that have been done be it in Sierra Leone and elsewhere, a lot of the time people have very good intentions to solve the energy crisis or the energy challenge in these local communities. However, after the solutions have been implemented, it kind of creates more problems. So an instance can be, if you're going to develop an energy project in a particular community that has a history of gender-based violence, inequality, um, etc., and then you bring an energy solution, you solve the energy challenge, but then you kind of solidify you know, inequality because those who have power will almost control every single thing. So when I was doing my co-creation process, I observed and see how I'm not going to fall within that same trap. So you had um, women kind of telling me exactly how they want the solution to function. They, most of the time, they don't have the expertise or generally anybody in the community never had the expertise of developing the technology, but then they wanted the technology that will fit in perfectly with the local community. The technology does not have to be something top-down, it has to be something that will blend instantly with their community. So kind of, those are, that, 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 that was a particular challenge that was very difficult to solve on how you're going to cater for that wide spectrum of sociocultural issues at play and make sure the solution is a reflection of that. Um, because at the end of the day, for me, I, I wanted a solution that would be scalable and I wanted a solution that would be sustainable. What's the point of having a great solution and then um, at the end of the day, it's a total mismatch from the community that you're going to implement it at. So kind of, that was a major challenge, the social cultural part. I mean, I think uh, when you, uh, there's this concept where if you solve uh, an issue, you open up other challenges or, that you, know, you need to address, but that opens up opportunities for innovation. You said something that about you know, funding and scalability. You know, with the project that you, and I'm, I'm as, a, as a personal interested, with the project that you mentioned where kinetic energies used two power cities or your community, do you think that's ever scalable for uh, a metropolitan city, for example? Uh, I mean, one day do you think people in Dubai or in New York could be walking the streets of, uh, and, and lighting up their cities uh, through kinetic energy? Absolutely. When you look at, when you look at, um, when you look at, for example, windmills, right? It's almost the same technology, just that it utilizes wind, right? And our cities are always moving, right? If you go to, say, New York, for example, 
2 a.m. doesn't look like 2 a.m. It's right. People are moving. Cars are moving. Our economy needs to move, right? And most of the time, our highways don't sleep, right? Which means there is this huge energy potential. But then, of course, you have the the research part. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of um, interest and passion for you to devote your time to kind of get it done. So, the feasibility part, yes. It is, but then are we actually willing to pour in resources? Are we willing to support young innovators who are within that space, right? Who are willing to spend their time, devote their lifetime to researching that? It was almost the same thing back then when solar came. Everybody was like, it's not possible. Here we are today, solar is all over the place. So I'm quite sure with the level of devotion that people like myself and others within the space are putting into it. 30 years, 40 years, it will be a total different conversation that we're going to have about fuse electricity. I'm going to go a little bit more personal and deeper. What are, what are the moments that matter the most to you? <laughs> so for me, um, I have a personal connection with the communities that I work with. The most important moments are when you go to these communities and then you have like kids walking up to you and telling you their experiences by just having access to a little bulb for studying or, you know, um, a little connection where when you go to other countries, this is not conversations that they have anymore, right? Access to energy is standardized. Everybody do have access to it, or most people do. But then for some of the communities that I work with, it's, it's an opportunity. It is a luxury that only a few could afford. So when you kind of break that barrier and try to see how Regardless of where somebody is or their socioeconomic status, they can access it as somebody who lives in Freetown. Then, and then when they walk up to you and tell you their experience, be it in terms of like their academic output, be it in terms of um, the, the, the peace within the household, bridging inequality, access to finances, women telling you, now I started my own business, right? Um, guys telling you, oh, my perception changed. I don't need to be the boss in the house. I should allow my kids to see what they want to see in the household. I should allow um, them to start their own initiatives. Right? They, they should all not be in the house because I want them to watch a particular movie, for example. Right? So when those personal stories right, are being told to you from people who, by just doing this little innovation right, over time, makes you just want to scale up more, makes you just want to do more, makes you want to work with them more to see how we can solve other interconnected challenges. So those are those are some moments that I think, whenever I come across those ones, make me realize the little effort that I'm putting into this whole thing is worth it. And also, um, I'm having my own impact in my own space. So, I think that's really important. One of the things that, you know, as you were speaking, I, I, I piqued my interest is what, there are two sides of this coin, right? So there's the youth that in your community that you said, you know, energy is not a luxury, it's a, it's a dream, potentially. And then you have the other youth around the world that have energy as a luxury. So what would you say, uh, or what would you advise both communities when it comes to the energy transition, how to work towards supporting projects like yours, or how to inspire the next generation of youth to support projects like yours? I think, so one of the things that I've really benefited from is um, collaboration. There are a lot of time when I've faced bottlenecks. I may, absolutely don't, I, I may absolutely don't have the required idea to kind of do a particular thing that I, that I want to do within my project. And then I, I'll meet like a young person who has a better skill than I do in that regard having those conversations and then willingly giving me two hours of their time per month, right? It's priceless. I don't have the money to pay them, but then they decided to give me their, their time, right? They decided to have conversations with me to unlock that light bulb moment. I think it's something that at times we um, underestimate basically on how, be it you finding yourself in Dubai, me finding myself in Togo, we have so much that we can collaborate on um, in terms of solving the different challenges that we are faced with, than we celebrate at times. And um, for now, for example, here, I've met amazing people who have um, ideas or who have expertise in particular areas that, are, that I'm exploring, going into, and those, having those conversations and knowing I have somebody that I can call 
right, who will give me 30 minutes of listening hours or listening minutes, is just priceless. And again, you know, as people who basically may have opportunities to simple things like energy or other opportunities, you have to realize that um, you have to, um, first of all, cherish those moments. And then secondly, look at the, the relationship that you have with those opportunities. So if you have access to energy in Dubai, and then you're not energy efficient, just know that a youth who is in Mozambique is going to be impacted by that lack of energy efficient behavior that you have in Dubai. So knowing how your behavior with the resources that you have here will impact somebody who don't have it in an adverse way will be also a mechanism for us to realize that you have something to contribute, right? So those are just a few insights. I know, uh, Jeremiah, you know, as you're explaining these things, I'm recalling the images that you showed me earlier, and I'd love, I'd love for the images to come on screen. And if you can just tell us a little bit about this, um, because, you know, beautiful images. So this is, this is a particular community that is 2,000 kilometers from Freetown. Um, and this community has um, a history of um, over 300 years. And you'll be surprised to know that they've never ever have access to energy at any point in time. And so when I went to this community, you could see the girls. <laughs> um, they came out. So um, we had like this long co-creation process, kind of understanding what exactly do they want and how can it be developed. And at some point, um, we settled on solar power, a mini grid, right, an off grid. Um, I wish we had a video of you seeing them dancing by just having access to electricity, right? So this is just one of the processes that I go through when I go to these communities. We have these long conversations and deliberations. And then you could see the little electricity all over the houses as the outcome of some of those conversations that we have. So kind of this village is called Macao. Um, they have about um, 130 or so households. And um, so this, was a, this, this conversation started on a Sunday. And um, every single person in that community didn't go out to the farm on that day because this was a very important moment for them in their history. And then we were able to create this electricity that they are enjoying today. So this is just a background story of this community. And I'm, I'm wondering, do, are these communities using your first technology at Open Optum Energy, which is the kinetic energy, or is it using your new microgrid solution? Yeah, they are using the microgrid solution for now. Because like for the Optimum Energy solution, it requires, of course, continued research. And not a lot of people are into it. So kind of, um, and then the whole energy crisis um, will not, is, is not going to wait for me to bring my solution. So we also have to utilize what we have. And um, when, you know, the conversation of solar came up in this community, we just have to use it. So they are using um, a microgrid that is powered by solar. What are your, when you're looking at these pictures, what, what does it remind you of the most? What, what, what's, what's your fondest memory? So when we started having the conversation, um, most of the women had to sit one place, right? They had to sit one place, and then the guys had to sit one place. And then at some point, I started asking the questions, why does it happen like that, right? And I told them that, um, I asked the women, are you comfortable with that? They're like, no, we want to mix. You could see at some point, there are some guys in between, um, the women. So that was one moment that was like, oh, wow, right? You have some certain issues that simple conversations can actually shift. And then later, at the end of the day, you had the women carrying the cables, the men also carrying the cables. And then we just did this great job, and there it is. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, that's community integration, and that's you creating a solution that is bringing people together. What do you think? That, what other positive outcomes have you seen tangibly within this community when it comes to the technology that you've produced? You have a lot of people that have started businesses um, because, okay, historically, you know, because there was lack of electricity, it means you wake up 7 or 8 a.m., or maybe you start your business at 9. By 4 or 5, when the sun starts going down, you have to close. 
So now people have created alternative businesses that starts in the evening. And then, of course, tremendous, the one thing that I'm very pleased with is for the kids. You have so many kids in this community who, for them, it was normal to study with, you know, pan lamp and stuff like that. And I also went through that. And now, whenever, wherever I am, right, be it if I'm in Freetown or if I'm in the village or I'm somewhere else, I know none of them is going to experience any health consequences of studying with a fossil, a fossil fuel based um, solution. And then, of course, you have the gender issues, right, wherein, um, Back in the days, you have, okay, there was a particular person in this village who owns a generator. And I will tell you, that person was more powerful than the chief. Whatever they say, everybody has to dance to that tune. Because whatever gadget you, has, you have, you, at the end of the three days or four days, take it to them to charge for you. So now, power is kind of disseminated to everybody. Right? We just the simple access to electricity. So kind of everybody now have access to electricity, which means they can speak freely. They can make informed decisions on their own without, you know, playing to the tone of somebody that has that generator. So you had these funny stories that used to happen that have just changed over time by just a simple solution. I think that's, that's a really interesting um, story and prospect of how that evolved. I want to sort of shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about Jeremiah, the 17-year-old who uh, won numerous awards, like Innovator of the Year, African, African Youth Award, so on and so forth. Tell me how that experience was and what got you to that through your innovations. For me, the most important thing was solving the crisis, right, or solving the problem. And Whatever comes after is just an added value. But then the most important thing was solving the, the... My energy, my attention was towards solving the problem. So when, when I started this whole thing, right, um, you, need, you need something that people, you know, will consider that you're very serious about this. And at some point when, you know, the accolades started coming, it, 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 it's nice. It makes you feel good. It makes you... It makes you realize that people are watching and people value what you're doing. But then for me, accolades are important, but then I think getting the job done is more vital than the accolades. And, and since the accolades started coming, of course, you, you have a lot of people that want to talk to you, and that is the good part of it. Kind of you have, quote and unquote, the stamp of approval of getting the job done. And, you know, having conversations with those people who are genuinely interested in creating a larger impact, as I'm doing, has been extraordinary. It has been, it has been very much exciting, I must say. And um, it really also gives me that sense that I need to continue doing what I do. I need to keep up the pace because I know now a lot of people are watching, not only the community that I work with, I, people are watching that I may have never come across. So kind of, it also keeps me on my toes. Did, did your support come after you won those awards or did it start before that? No, it started before that. So my biggest supporter was my mother, right? Always holding my back down. Um, you, so when, when, we, when I started this whole thing, right, I was kind of picking trash to my school. Of course, teachers at times don't play. They'll beat you here and there. But then at some point, the teachers has to just accept the way I was. They know the next day I'll pick up a new trash to the school. And so, and then I... I was only able to continue doing that because whenever I go home, I'll, be, I'll tell my mother, oh, they flogged me today for taking trash to school. She's like, do it again, right? And then when I started having that support from home and from school, you know, it's, it's really pushed me. And then you had um, institutions like WAF coming in. Back then I was still a teenager, doing my own little thing in my own corner. And then they came and they're like, oh, you're doing great. Come, we need in our communities. And then not only giving me an award as a celebration of my work, but then also putting me in a community of like-minded young people, having access to skills or opportunities has just been tremendous. So I had a lot of support before like big awards started coming on board. What, you know, as, as you look to the, towards the future, what are you planning for? 
What are your outlooks as Jeremiah and what are, what are your hopes for the future? So my hope basically is how we're going to have an energy transition that will be equitable for all. So for me, my, my future aspirations is how can we develop solutions, right? Um, in a way that wherever you are, you can access them. So the accessibility issue, the finance issue, the um, technology knowledge dissemination um, process. So that is what I'm pushing forward to, how we can have an energy transition that will be reflective of the global cry. Right? As a Sierra Leonean, I don't have to rely on UAE for my energy security or for my energy future. But then I can work with UAE to develop my own energy future. So kind of those are the things I'm looking forward to on how we can cross-continentally collaborate or as young people we can kind of co-create our solutions, exchange expertise, resources, um, breaking barriers basically on how we break the dependency thing that we've seen over time and see how we can put everybody on a level for them to adequately develop their own energy future based on their history or their future aspirations. So for me, that is one thing I look forward to. Be it the work that I do within Optim Energy or other institutions that I work with. And for Optim Energy, my future aspirations is within the next five to 10 years, I want to see how I can work with about 100,000 people. It's a lot of number. I absolutely don't have an idea of how I'm going to do it. But then I know the little steps that I take will actually get me to that point. So that is my future aspiration. What, what would you say is the, the best approach for, for example, for us to collaborate? I mean, you know, the, often people say, you know, we need to collaborate, we need to work together better. How can we do that? We just have to have honest conversations, right? Um, I think listening is a great way to start. And also knowing that, you know, we're coming from different realities. The challenges that I, that I may face with is not what you faced with. And your aspirations may not be a representation of mine. But then having those honest conversations and knowing what I'm looking forward to and also knowing what, you can, what you're looking forward to and finding that middle ground will be a huge game changer. Most of the time, those of us from Africa, we have the solutions, we are working on the solutions, but then we don't have the resources. And there are times our technologies fall short and most of the time technologies are available in these spaces. So how can we leverage on the research you're doing or the funds or the resources that you have to kind of see how we can um, create solutions and then um, take it from there. So I think in terms of resource, in terms of co-creating, in terms of technology transfer, knowledge transfer, there's a lot of synergies that can be formed over time. How can we connect the youth community here at COP with you? I have no idea, but Social media is a great way to start. Um, uh, of course, as youth, we've done it over time. We can easily walk up to ourselves and start a conversation and great things come out of it. So I'm very much open. Anybody can walk up to me. We can have conversations and we can take it out of the space. Jeremiah, I, uh, you know, you reminded me of, uh, of a saying that I read somewhere where it, it goes, we don't inherit our earth from our ancestors we borrow it from our children and future generations so i think that it's 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 a really important thing that we're able to find solutions even where it you know a lot might consider it in the most unlikely places i want to end with before we close i want to end with one more comment from you which is what is one thing that you would advise anyone here or in the world to do to help contribute to a brighter future where your dreams of what you've built in Sierra Leone can trickle through many places? I think um, every single person in this room has something to do. Um, of course, some people may call themselves climate activists, some people may not call themselves climate activists, but then regardless of your profession, you may be a medical doctor, you may be a software engineer, you have a vital skill to contribute. Mentorship is so important. 
work a journey with a young person. I have lots and lots of experienced people that have worked a journey with me. Um, I can always call them and then they'll lend me their experiences to inform the decisions that I make. So if you are a person in this room who over time have accumulated so much experience, it's on you to see how you can use that experience um, to enable a young person to create that change. You may not have the time, but then we have all the time in the world. Right? We want to create that change. So I think um, your mentorship, we need it. We will never continue to be shy to ask you for your mentorship. We only require your time. And if you know any way to open a door for us, please open those doors for us. And whenever you invite us to have conversations, please listen to us. We need your listening ear. We know at times we can be very annoying, <laughs> but that is just us being scared of the world that we are currently living in. That is our reality. Of course, you have your own realities. We're not taking that away from you, but then just allow us to vent, listen to our crazy ideas, give us feedback, mentor us. It is with you having that um, intergenerational dialogue that will enable us to scale up our solutions that will enable us to um, create a, a, a meaningful impact that collectively all of us are going to look back and be proud to say we did this. So I think that is one thing that I have to tell all of you here. I think it's a very important message. I think the important message is as well what you touched on is intergenerational exchange. As youth, it's important that we not only focus about what we can do, but to also learn from older generations what they did and to grasp some of that knowledge and that wisdom. As I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of the times what we live in today is not the same as what our forefathers have lived in. And so the knowledge that they had back then is different to the knowledge that we have today, but the values, it's the values of grit, resilience, it's the values that we take with us, that we plant in the seeds of uh, plant the seeds of tomorrow using those values with the knowledge of today. I think that's that's very important. I want to close with a story that I read once, and it goes: there are two neighbors, and for me, that's an anecdote uh, for uh, countries, for different cities, for people. There are two neighbors uh, that had a stream in between them and they wanted to cross over to the other side. And so they were discussing from uh, the, across the, the stream uh, that they need to build a bridge. But the funny thing is, none of them knew how to build a bridge. And so uh, serendipitously, a, a carpenter uh, along the way came and he said, you know, we can build a bridge, I can help you guys. I heard you guys speaking, but first we must build a bench. And so they asked him, why should we build a bench? And so he said, for before we build the bridges of collaboration, we must first build the benches of dialogue. And so I think this is why it's so important that you and I here had this conversation. And I don't think it stops here today. I think it continues. And I look forward to hearing about your success and to seeing you here in the UAE and to hearing about Optum Energy's continued success. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone here on behalf of Mubadala, Mubadala Youth Council, uh, and uh, the entire audience here. Thank you very much. Thank you.